people praising God in their own native tongue. It wasn't some far out, something nobody could understand. It was very plainly stated as a language that is known on earth and was known to those people. And from there, and from there we find out that when, as soon as that happened, the apostle Peter got up and he preached, and he preached to them that you have crucified the Lord of glory. He told those Jews who had, who had stood outside Pilate's gates and shouted, crucify him, crucify him, that they were guilty. And they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? And he told them to repent, which means to turn from their, their evil way, to turn from their, their, their false belief in a works-based system. They didn't believe on Jesus as their Savior. And he's the only way to heaven. There is no other way. You can't be good enough. You can't do enough religious things to get you to heaven. You, can't, you can get baptized. And I'm thankful Donnie's getting baptized this morning. But Donnie understands he got fully saved right there sitting where Miss Joanne sitting. Am I right? Right. Baptism is just going to be you saying to, the, to everybody here this morning, hey, I want you all to know that I am a, a changed man. I'm, not because of what I've done, because of what Christ has done in me, and I'm putting on my Jesus uniform by identifying with his death, burial, and resurrection. I want the world to know what's happened on the inside, and I'm going to show you on the outside. So when he told them to repent, he simply, he simply meant, you thought that your good works and your good life is going to do it, and, and all the things that you do in your religion, but you need to turn around and you need to come to the one who died for you, and you need to bow at his feet, and you need to believe on him. That's to repent. That means you turn from your way, which will send you to hell, and you turn to God and you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, who shed his blood and died and was buried and rose from the grave for you. And he said, then you ought to get baptized. And then, and then once you get baptized, then the power of God will come to you and you'll be able to do things we're doing. You'll be able to go out and witness and you'll have, you'll have the power of God to witness. So that brings us this morning, by the way, the Bible tells us that some 3,000 people got saved that day. 3,000 people. I bet you haven't heard that preached near as much as you have people talk about tongues. See, the emphasis is in the wrong place. The emphasis ought to be on the saving of souls because that's really what it comes down to. That's all that's important is souls being saved. So let's look in chapter 3, verse 1, and we're going we're gonna to read the first nine verses, then we're going to pray, and then we'll get into this message this morning. But I just want to share with you again how, how thrilled I am that you're all here this morning. And uh, God knew you'd be here, and God knew that I'd be here. And so this is an appointment made by God, and we're here for a reason. So please give God your undivided attention, and I'll try not to mess things up along the way. Amen? Let's go, let's go ahead and read verses 1 through, through 9, and then, or I say 1 through 9, 1 through 8, and then we'll pray. Acts chapter 3, 1 through 8. Now, J Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alms, and Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately... His feet and ankles, bones received strength, and he leaping up stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking, leaping, and praising God. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Father, I love you. I thank you this morning. I thank you for this honor and privilege to stand behind this pulpit and preach the word of God. I thank you, Lord, that you filled this church up this morning. Lord God, I'm so thrilled to have so many faces Lord, to preach to. Father, I'm so thankful that they came. And Lord, I ask you now, do a work in each heart. Holy Ghost of God, you know the need of every person sitting in every seat in this place. Lord God, you not only know their needs, but you know the needs of all those who are listening in through the Internet this morning all over this world. Lord, I know there's people in the Philippines. I know there's people in England and Canada and all over the world listening to us. Lord, we rejoice for them, and we thank you and ask you to bless them and meet their needs. Father, but I pray for these in this room. 
Lord God, that you direct your, direct your, your power, Lord, right to their need and that you meet it. Lord, I pray they'd be open and responsive to your working in their life. Please put your hand on this preacher. Forgive me and cleanse me. Fill me with your power from your Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray you'd use me. Pour me out this morning for them, Lord. I just want to be a blessing, Lord. Use us now in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. If there's a title to be put on this message, it's this. There is power in the name of Jesus Christ. There is power. There's a lot of people in this world think they got power. I saw this last week some billionaire shot himself into the upper atmosphere in a rocket. Did y'all see that? Jeff Bezos or whatever. He could, they could have cured world hunger with the money they spent on that one little old trip. You realize that? They, all kinds of people think they got power, but you know as, as, as high as they want to shoot that rocket, they ain't, that ain't nothing. Not compared to what our God can do. Amen? Not compared to what our God can do. Acts 6, 3, verse 1 through 8, we'll start right there. Now, Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. Now, now y'all remember what Peter and John, their vocation was? Y'all remember what they was originally? Somebody tell me what Peter and John were originally. Huh? Fishermen. You got it. That's right. That's what they've been doing their whole life. Their daddies were in that business. They grew up digging worms and baiting hooks and casting nets. That's all they'd known. What did Jesus tell them when he called them out? He said, henceforth you shall catch what? Men. Y'all ain't fishing for fish no more. Now we're fishing for men. And wherever they went, Jesus preached, Jesus taught, and they preached and they taught. And what were they fishing for? They were fishing for men. They were trying to, to bring souls into the kingdom of God. Amen? They're not bringing them in so they can skin them and clean them. Amen? They're bringing them in so they can be saved. Hallelujah. So I want you to remember that that's what we are doing here. From, from, from the day of Pentecost when Peter stand, stood up to preach, they began fishing in earnest for men. The church was in its infancy, and they were filled with the Spirit of God. I want you to realize that, remember that the whole way through. Everything you see these apostles doing, they were filled with the Holy Ghost of God. They were leaning upon God. They were urgently in prayer for the Spirit of God to empower them, give them wisdom, leading, and give them power in every situation. So Peter and John went up together, then went to the temple, at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour, if you want to catch fish, you have to go where the fish are, are gathering and that, don't you? If you want to catch, I mean, you may go fishing, but if you want to go catching, you got to go where they're biting, right? Am, am I right? Okay, y'all help me, y'all help me, and I'll preach you. It won't be a very long, I promise you. Y'all help me. But anyway, so you go where, if you want to catch men, you go where there's needy men. You go where there's men that are searching for God. That's where they went. They went to the temple. It was people there searching for God. There was people there needy. Guess what else they did? I see that they went up together at the hour of prayer. It's 9 o'clock. It's 3 o'clock in the afternoon. It's the busiest time in the temple. They went up there. You know why they went in the busiest time? Somebody say, well, that's inconvenient them to go up there in the busiest time. No, they want to reach the most people that they could reach. If you want to reach a crowd, you've got to go to a crowd. Now, remember, they weren't intimidated by this crowd. You know why they weren't intimidated by this crowd? Because they had the Holy Ghost of God inside of them. Amen? They had the power of God on them. And the Bible said in verse 2, And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple. Okay? It says he was lame from his mother's womb. He was born this way. I hear people talk about all kinds of things. They said they was born this way. You know what? He was born that way. You know what? He couldn't do a thing about it. You know what? We're all born messed up. Y'all know that? Everybody in this world is born a sinner. Our first parents, Adam and Eve, they sinned against God, and because of that, sin entered into the human race, and every one of us inherits it. Now, listen, that's my baby daughter sitting right there, middle way back, my wife holding her. 
I know I look too old to have a baby daughter, but I got a baby daughter. She's one year old. But do you know what I know? She is a sinner. Does she know it yet? No. But she is a sinner. Every single child comes into this world lost, without God, having a sin nature. And this man was born sinner, a sinner. He was born that way. He couldn't help it. That's where he come into this world. And the Bible said that he was, that he was laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called beautiful. That's the beautiful gate. It was, it was a, uh, one particular gate there at the temple, and it was, a ta- it was, it was one that was frequent and went through a lot. And so they, 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 what I realize about this, it's obvious here that his so-called friends and family is it, we can't help you. We're tired of helping you. You say to me everything we got. Well, we don't have to take you up there and let somebody else help you. What did he tell me? His, his mom and daddy couldn't help him. His friends couldn't help him. You know what? I'm going to tell you something. If you're lost, if you're lost in sin, listen to me, if you don't have salvation, if you don't have Jesus Christ as your Savior, your mom and daddy can't help you none. You've got a condition they can't do a thing about. Oh, yeah, they can take a belt to your hand in. They can put a paddle on your backside. They can correct you for a while, but they can't get you through the, through the gates of heaven with that. There's only one that can do that, and that's Jesus Christ. Yes, he, he, he tried. I mean, he, he wished he could have done something about it, but he couldn't. He says they left him to the mercies of, mercies of strangers. He was dependent on this world for help. What a sad case of this. When you're left dependent on this world for your help. Now, I know these people in this world does good. I understand that. And I'm not knocking those that do. There's some great charities in this world that do wonderful work. But I'm going to tell you, they can only do so much. All they can do is treat his symptoms. All they can do is treat his symptoms. Hey, Amen. I'm going to tell you all real quick. Don't worry about them babies making noise. That don't bother me one bit. I see y'all looking around. Don't worry about it. Babies in a church mean there's life in a church. And I'm happy with babies. Amen. I got one. <laughs> but I want but I want you to see, all they can do is treat the symptoms. Listen, this world don't have an answer for a spiritual problem. They'll throw every kind of pill they can at it, but they can't fix the problem. All they can do is match the symptoms. Sin is something that you can't fix. And your neighbor can't fix it. Your mama, your daddy, your grandpa. Yeah, anybody. They can't fix it. Doctor can't fix it. Nobody said Jesus. The Bible said in verse 3, that this lame man laying there by the gate, he, he said, who's seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asking alms. He said, what's the alms? Let's give me some money. I need help. That's what that is. Sirs, can y'all spare some change? for this poor old cripple fella sitting here at this gate. That's what he was saying. And the Bible says, And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. Now realize, this ain't just, they're walking by the sidewalk and there's some guy sitting there. There are people going everywhere. All right? Kind of like, kind of like when, when we, was, we was up there on vacation. These people going everywhere from everywhere. Same kind of situation. I mean, every kind of license plate you think of, you can see in Pitching Forge, Tennessee. Well, they, they were people were like elbow to elbow going through there. Crowds of people. So it wasn't right. It wouldn't be nothing for them to walk by and not make eye contact. But, and he asked Peter's turn, and he looked him right dead in the eye. And John turned, and he looked him right dead in the eye. And he said, look at us. He got his attention. Though the whole world was moving around them, they had a little... A little brief window of eye contact, and, and, and it's like the whole rest of the world seems to be. They had a, an intimate eye-to-eye conversation. And listen to me. Hey, listen. These Holy Ghost men heard the cry of a needy man. You know that's what they were looking for? They were out fishing. What do you do when you're sitting over on the bike fishing, and you throw in your, you throw in your line way out there in the water, and you see a big one swimming right there by the bank? You let sucker in, you drop your line, don't you? You want to catch him. And that's exactly what they did. They were on a fishing expedition, and they, they, they heard the first cry. And they turned to him. A needy man's an opportunity. You know why that is? Because we serve a God, and what he does, he's a need meter. 
God is a need meter. You say, I got needs, preacher. I got all kinds of needs in my life. Guess what? You've come to the right place because the need meter dwells here with us. Now, he gave heed unto them is what the Bible said. He paid attention. He quit, paying, he quit looking at everything else, and he focused on them. He gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something. He said, oh, goody, goody, they're going to give me some money. Goody, goody, it's going to be all right. I'll be okay. And I, I, I can probably get me something to eat. I'll sit here and with my, chew on my, my bread or whatever and sit there on my, and I'll ask for some more money. There ain't nothing wrong with that. He had to. They, some people in this world does that and don't have to. There's plenty of them stands on the street corner and they just want to go get some beer so they stand up there and act like they're hungry. There's plenty of that. There's plenty of them that come up and tell you their mom was in the hospital in, in Ada, Oklahoma, about to die with a brain uh, a tumor, and, and, and she you, you got to have $10 to get there. There's lots of that. I've seen a lot of that in this ministry. But not for this guy. Not for this guy. He expected to get something, but the Bible says, and Peter said... Silver and gold have on none. He wasn't lying to him. He was broke. He didn't have any money. He'd been walking all over the earth for the last three and a half years with Jesus. He ain't been catching fish and taking it to the market. He didn't have any money. Listen to what he said. Now hear what I'm about to say. He said, I don't have any silver and gold. He said, but such as I have, give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Now, hold on. For some people, to say silver and gold have I none, but the worst thing they can say. Oh, Lord. How rude. They, he didn't even have any money. And, 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 and by the way, they feel like the church is in ruins if we ain't got money to just give out to the poor. Can you tell you something? First National Bank of Jesus. We all poor folks, too. <laughs> Amen. We all struggling too. Listen, it's not God didn't call the church to take care of, of, every, of all the poor in the world. Jesus said, "The poor you shall always have with you." We can't solve the world's problems. But I'm going to tell you something. They think it's a pity if the church doesn't have money to give to the world. But guess what's worse? If the church never has the spiritual power to say, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk, that's far worse than not having money to hand out. I read this quote last night. I had to write it down. It said, it's not the church's business in this world to simply make the present condition more bearable. The task of the church is to release here on earth the redemptive work of God in Christ. We're here to set men free, not to help men get to the next meal. We're to set him free. Verse 7, the Bible said, And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. Now, I want you to understand something. At that moment, the Holy Ghost of God took over Peter and did something miraculous. He imparted something to Peter. He gave him something in that moment. In that moment, if you, if you want to look over there, you can look over in 1 Corinthians 12, 9, but I'll just read it to you otherwise. In that moment, the Bible describes something in, in, that cha in that chapter and verse. It says, to another faith by the same Spirit. To another faith is given by the same Spirit, and to another the gift of healing by the same Spirit. In that moment, Peter was given the gift of faith and the gift of healing in that moment to do that. It wasn't Peter thinking, boy, I can do this. No, it was God working in Peter. Peter went in confidence and boldness because he was sent out by God to accomplish a task to reach lost sinners, to bring them into the kingdom of God through the blood of Jesus Christ. And he went with confidence in God. It was not in himself or any religion. It was in God. And when he reached down and he grabbed that man by the hand, he had no doubt that that man was going to stand up for <laughs> He believed. He had seen God work in miraculous things. He had seen Jesus Christ raised from the dead, and he believed in the resurrection power of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he believed that God was able to raise that man. Now I want you to notice something there. I want you to notice that the change that occurred. Listen to me. I want you to notice that the change that occurred in that man's life was immediate. One gradual. He didn't have to go see the doctor four or five times and go to rehab and work his 
legs out in the little exercise machine and all that. Yeah, do that like you did, Chester. I know you wish you'd have skipped it too, amen. But uh, I know Mama did too. But you know, hey, listen, he didn't have to do that. No, no. It happened immediately. When you get saved, let me tell you something happened to you. Hey, what, this man had a condition that the world couldn't do nothing about with God too. Hey, man, listen to me. When a person's lost and, and dead in their sins and on their way to hell, you got a condition you can't do anything about and can't know anybody else do anything about. Only God can do it. And just like that, this man, he couldn't do a thing for himself. Peter couldn't do a thing for him, but God could. And when God did, he stood up. And it happened like that. His bones went from no strength. Now, listen to what it said there. It said immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. That means they had no strength before. They were, listen, they were emaciated little legs, those tiny, drawn up legs. They couldn't have no strength in them. And immediately he had strong legs. Peter didn't do that. I was in verse 8, and he leaping up stood and walked and entered with them into the temple. Walking and leaping, praising God. He never leaped in his life. Do you realize that? He didn't know what a leap was. He never done it. But he jumped up from there that day like a kid in the seventies, jumping up to go watch cartoons on Saturday morning. I mean, he come up from there quick. Amen. Hallelujah. There was no hesitation on his part either that he was going to follow God's people, to follow God and walk with God's people. Hey, there was no hesitation. Immediately, right then, he went with them. He said, "I'm going with you guys." You know what? When somebody gets saved, there ought not be any hesitation on them to get to church. There ought not be any hesitation on them to get involved in the Lord's work. There ought not be any hesitation to praise God, give Him glory with your life. Amen. When God does something, when He changes you, amen, there ought to be a noticeable difference. There wasn't any hesitation to make His profession public either. Notice what it says there. He leaping up, stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking, leaping, and praising God. I don't think there was any confusion as to whether or not this pillar was different on the inside. Not just, not just on the It was obvious everybody was different on the outside. But there's something changed on the inside, too. And that was easy for everybody there to see. See, he had, most, he had more excitement. I want you to look at this and think about this. This man had more excitement than most churches would tolerate. He was leaping and jumping and praising God. And I dare say in most churches, if somebody jumped up this morning with the leaping and jumping and praising God, everybody's getting, quit that. Don't be doing that. We don't do that in here. God help us if that's where we're at. We ought to leap, jump, and praise God. Amen. We ought to land, land straight on our feet speaking English, but we ought to leap and jump and praise God. Hallelujah. Now let's jump over here in this verses 9 through 11. I got 15 minutes. I think I can do it. All right, now look here in verse 9, verse 9 through 11. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. Hmm. He had a testimony now, didn't he? Amen. You ought to have a testimony once you get saved. People ought to know there's something different about you. Amen. And they all, and they knew that it was he that which sat at alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. They, they saw him, every, they walked by him all the time. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened to him. Wow, what has happened to him? I've never seen him stand up before. I've never even seen him move off his off of his backside. This guy he never looked at him. His legs were tiny. Look at him now, they look normal. It's incredible. Wow. They also the crowd started migrating to him. And the lame man which was healed held Peter and John. Oh, he was hugging them. Thank you, thank you. I imagine he was weeping and crying and praising God and hugging their necks. He held them, and all the people ran together unto them in the porch that is called Solomon's greatly wondering. So a crowd began to rush in to see what in the world's going on while they're sitting there hugging and rejoicing and praising God. All these people packed in around them like sardines. What, what, why did that happen? Because, number one, like I said, they saw a miraculous change in this man who had been that way for all their, as far back as they could remember. And you know what? They knew what he used to be. They knew what he used to be. This ain't the same fella no more. Something's happened to him. Something's happened. 
They wanted to know what had happened. Let me tell you what happened. Look back here in verse 6. He said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. The name of Jesus Christ. The name of Jesus Christ got in the middle of it. That's what happened. Amen. There's power in the name of Jesus Christ. Hey, the Bible says, Thou hast exalted thy name above thy word. Hey, the name of Jesus is the most powerful thing in this universe. They knew what it used to be, but it wasn't that way anymore. You know what? They wanted to know what happened. They wanted some explanation. They wanted to know how this was possible. Amen. So let's look here in verses 12 through 26, and I'm going to go through them quick. So ride this with me. Remember what I said a couple weeks ago about what God says that the Jews require a sign, but the Greeks seek after wisdom, where God divided us. The Jews, because that's just the way God made them. They required miracles and wonders and signs and things in order to believe that God was working. But, you know, now today, well, all we need is the Word of God and the Spirit of God. We seek after wisdom. We want the Holy Ghost of God to lead us. We don't have to have miracles every Sunday to believe God's here. All right, but these were Jews. You've got to remember, this whole group of people that we're talking about this morning were Jews. So this miracle occurred. Why? God used it to get those Jews' attention. To realize he's working. He's here. And when they all came and assembled, Peter said, okay, it's preaching time. It's preaching time. Hallelujah. Got a crowd together. I'm going to preach a little bit. That's what he said. That's what he was thinking. I guarantee you. I'm ready now. Got them all around me. Hallelujah. The Bible said in verse 12, listen, and when Peter saw it, he looked around and he says, <laughs> Hallelujah, this is just like Pentecost. He started to preach. But let me tell you, there's, 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 there's two reasons for his sermon. It's to bring people to Christ to repent of their sin in crucifying the Lord Jesus Christ. And it was for them to believe in him now that he's glorified, gone back to heaven, and to agree and comply with what the Father's design is, is that they worship Him and they praise Him and they give Him glory. And that's what this message is about. He's got them there now. They've been walking in this false religion that's been not been saving them at all because they didn't, they didn't follow the Messiah. They're just going through a works ritual all the time, trying to convince themselves that they're holy before God, but they weren't. They needed Christ. So when Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, Ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Why look you so earnestly on us, as though by our own power or holiness we made this man to walk? We didn't do this. This is not us. The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son Jesus, whom ye delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But she denied the Holy One and the just and desired a murderer to be granted unto you and killed the Prince of Life, whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. And his name, through faith in his name, hath made this man strong. Yes, he's telling you, he's Jesus. It's the one you nailed to that tree. That's the one done what you see today. Whom you see and know. He said, this man whom you see and know, yea, the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness and the, in the presence of you all. And now, brethren, I want that you, that means I know, I know that through ignorance you did it. You didn't know he was the Lord of Lord, glory. You didn't know he was the Prince of life. You didn't see it. You couldn't understand it. He said, I know you, didn't, you did it in ignorance. He said, as also your rulers. But those things which God hath before has showed by the mouth of all his prophets that Christ should suffer, 
he has so fulfilled. The Bible has been telling ever since the beginning, the Old Testament prophets have been prophesying that Jesus was going to come, that he would be born of a virgin, that he would grow up, and he wouldn't be anything that anybody would look upon, and, and, and he, wouldn't be no, he wouldn't be nothing lofty and lifted up. No, he'd be humble all the days of his ministry and his life. And he would come and he would die and be a substitute for these people that he would bear their sins. And they rejected him. They didn't think they needed him. There's people all over America. There's people all over Clarksville, Texas. They don't think they need him. So I'm going to tell you something. When you come to your last breath, and you're about to slip out of the eternity, it's too late to realize you need him then. You say, well, I'll wait till I get older, and then I'll, then I'll trust Christ because i got my life to live. I don't know if you checked the obituaries in the paper, but they people of all ages in there. They little babies that die. They little toddlers that die. They, they kids in their, in, their, in their teenage years that die. They people in their 20s that die, and so on and so forth. You, can't, you ain't guaranteed your next breath. Do you realize that? You're not guaranteed another day. Now is the day of salvation. Now is the time. He said, and now, brethren, I, he said, I know you did it through ignorance. But those things which God has before has showed by the mouth of all his prophets that Christ should suffer, he has so fulfilled. It's done. He's dead. He's buried. He's raised from the grave. Repent, you therefore. They say repent. Repent means you're going this way. Turn around and go the right way. Go to God. And say, God, Father, I've I, I sinned against you. I've, I've sinned in your sight. And I know that I've sinned against you. And I need to be forgiven. I need my sins forgiven. I need to be washed clean, Father. Wash me in the blood of Jesus. I believe that he died for my sins. I believe he paid my sin debt. I believe that he didn't stay buried. No, you, you're satisfied that he made the payment and he was raised from the grave. And I believe it. And I trust him to pay my sin debt. Repent, you therefore, and be converted, he says. Get saved, that your sins may be blotted out. Can I tell you something this morning? People say, well, I got saved and I didn't want to go to hell. That's not what you get saved from. You get saved from your sin. Your sin will send you to hell, but your sin is what stands in the way. It's not hell. Hell's just a destination. It's the way back for those who didn't want Jesus. God has a way to bend. Amen, and God has a heaven too, and he wants you there. Repent you therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. Amen, hallelujah. Sins blotted out means they ain't there no more. The blood of Jesus Christ. I know it's a staining agent, but it can wash your sins and blot them right out. And they ain't there no more. And then he said, believe. He's telling her, he, saw, he said, the first part was, you need to repent. The first part struck a wound, amen. It opened it up. It was a blow. But the second half is the balm that heals. He said, believe. You see, repent's just one side of the coin. Turning around and saying, Lord, I know I'm wrong. I know I've sinned against you. Lord, I know I'm wrong. I'm turning around. That's just part of it. You've got to believe. But uh, by the way, you won't ever turn around unless you believe. You won't ever believe unless you turn around. You say, well, I don't know how to turn around. You just simply go to God. That's it. It's not some dramatic thing. You just simply go to God. Verse 20, And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive unto the times of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world begun. In other words, he's going back to heaven until the second coming when he comes back to this earth, and someday he'll come back to this earth, and he's going to put down every single government on this earth. Hey, Jesus is going to rule on this earth. Amen. It could, you know what? That's at least no less than seven years away from right now. Anything. That clock starts ticking. And he'll but you see, again, this is written to the Jews. This is not written to the church. He's talking to all these Jews. And he's telling them, listen, Christ is coming back. He's talking about the second coming. 
He said, For Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Yet you shall hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. He was speaking about Jesus. He's speaking about the Messiah who was coming. And it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. He's saying you better believe on him because there's a hell to shun and a heaven to gain. And judgment is coming. The Bible says over in Hebrews, as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. I'm going to tell you, everybody in this world right now seems to be terrified of COVID. I'm going to tell you, all over the world COVID. And that's the judgment of God. People are doing all kinds of things to protect themselves from that disease. But what are they doing to protect themselves from the wrath that is to come? I tell you, I'd be a whole lot more afraid of God and his wrath than I would be some bug I can't see. Because I can see his wrath in this book upon those who don't believe on his son. He said in verse 25, he speak, again, he's speaking to the Jews because look what he says. Ye are the children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, In thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. Unto you first, God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. That's, that goes right along with what Paul said in, first, in, in Romans 1.16. He said, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Yes, on the day of Pentecost, the gospel was preached to the Jews. And here in the temple, the gospel was preached to the Jews first. But now this morning, right here this morning in Temple Baptist Church, it's being preached to the Gentiles. Like I said, this man came and he had no way to heal himself. He was in a bad shape. The world couldn't do a thing for him. But, oh, there's power in the name of Jesus. My friend, I'm going to tell you this morning, I don't know your need. I said this morning, everybody in here has got a need. I don't know what it is, but God knows. And God knows right where your need is, and God knows just right, now, right how to apply what needs to be applied to it to fix it. If there's somebody in this room that's, that's not saved, and you say, if I died today, preacher, I don't know where I'd go. I mean, if you just be honest with yourself and with, with God, you need to address that. Because we don't never know what we're guaranteed in this life. Not one single day is guaranteed. Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, listen to what it says. It said, therefore, therefore, if any man be in Christ, that means that means that is describing a person who's come needy just like that man did and realizing that Jesus Christ is the only one that can take your sin away. He can wash it completely gone to where when God the Father looks down upon you, he doesn't see your sin anymore. He sees Jesus Christ. He sees Jesus when he looks at you. And that's why he wants to bless the one who's saying, it's not because I'm a good person or they're a good person or she or he's a good person. It's because it's Jesus that God sees because we're covered in his blood. If it weren't for the blood of Jesus, I wouldn't be worth kicking across the street. I'm here to tell you, but because I have Christ, I'm not what I used to be. Amen? I'm not what I will be someday. But praise God, I'm not what I used to be. If any man be in Christ, the Bible said he is a new creature. A new creature. When that man, when that man believed, when Peter reached out and said, in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. You know what he did in that moment? He believed. You know what happened? He became a new creature, didn't he? God made it so that there was an outward manifestation so that those Jews right there in front of him, the deed of could see that God could change them in. I'm here to tell you. You didn't know me back then, but if you did me back then, you'd see that God has changed the man completely. There are many people in this room who stand up and testify the same thing, that if you only knew me years ago, you'd know that God has changed me. As my friend I saw this week said, my buddy Mark Wheeler, he said, if God, something big as God moves into your life, he's going to stick out somewhere. Amen? If you don't have Christ this morning, I urge you. We're going to sing a song of invitation here in just a moment. We're going to stand and sing. I urge you right now 
commit yourself to believing on Christ. You come to him. You, you can do it right where you sit. You don't even have to. You can do it before we even start to sing. But I'm telling you, if you don't know for sure that you're going to heaven when you die, believe on Christ. Go to him in prayer. Bow your head and say, Jesus, I'm a sinner. I want to be clean. I want to be washed of my sins. I believe you died for me. I believe they buried you, but you rose from the grave. And I trust you now as my Savior. That's all it takes is believing and trusting what he's done for you. Let's stand together. We're going to sing a song of invitation. If the Lord moves on your heart, I urge you to come and do business with him. There's an altar here. There's an altar there. You're welcome to come and kneel and pray. If you need me to pray with you, I'll be glad to do that. Whatever your need is this morning, this is the time. This is the place. This is the hour. We're going to sing number 375. You want to go ahead and turn there? I'm going to lead us in a word of prayer, and we're going to sing. Father, we thank you this morning. Lord, I thank you so much for the Word of God. I thank you for the people that come to the house. Lord, I pray this morning that now in this time, this invitation time, Lord, you draw people, you draw souls, Lord, to you. Lord, you do a work in their heart. If there's some among us that need Jesus, need to be saved, Father, I pray this will be the hour that come to Christ and get born again. Lord, there's something I'm going to get to, away from God. I pray this be the more, this be the moment that they come back and rededicate themselves to you. Father, I pray whatever it needs be, somebody go to our church or whatever it needs. I pray this be the moment. Have your way in this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 375. Good day, bye. Just stand by Oh.